very much, everybody who is here this evening and live streaming in your pajamas online at home. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Dr. Brian Henney. I am Professor of Philosophy and Environmental Studies at Gonzaga University. And I'm also happy to serve as uh, director of the Center for Climate, Society, and the Environment, our host for this evening's event. This event is a part of a, of a series we've been doing all year um, on different aspects of climate change. Last event, we hosted a senior advisor to uh, presidential envoy on climate change, John Kerry, on international responses to climate change. So we go from the international scene to uh, the very, very, very local uh, scene and trying to understand and respond uh, to climate change. But as we begin, I'd like to also acknowledge that Gonzaga University resides on the homelands of the Spokane tribal people, the people of the river. Indeed, it's only because of the local tribes inviting of our Jesuit founders to the region that Gonzaga University exists at all. And we're very thankful uh, that they did. We have much uh, to thank them for. As I mentioned, our evening, uh, this the event this evening is hosted uh, by the Gonzaga Climate Center. It's uh, informed by an abiding commitment to a just society and care for our common home that we started this center just last April in order to host events related to understanding and responding to the challenge of climate change. And uh, this event is part of that. I'd like to mention that we have another event coming up, a free event next uh, week on Tuesday, just a week from tomorrow, with Dr. Karen Litvin from the University of Washington, becoming planetary from the personal to the political. And then at the end of April, at the end of Earth Week, we're co-hosting uh, with colleagues from St. John's Cathedral and colleagues at Whitworth University, a conference called Hope for Creation, a two-day conference at St. John's Cathedral. And then this summer, we have a virtual event with a famous economist, uh, former senior economist at the World Bank, Herman Daly, on economics for a whole world. And you can register for all of those on our website online. Uh, tonight, inspired by a colleague uh, who had this idea last event, um, if you're at home and you'd like to try and participate, uh, you can try emailing me at climatecenter at gonzaga.edu uh, during the talk if you have a question for our speaker. Uh, you can give that a try and <laughs> see if, uh, if we can actually pose one of those to our speaker. So uh, pay attention at home and maybe you can uh, participate as, wel as well. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening. Uh, just because many of you might be coming from other parts of the world, I wanted to clarify that we are not here. Uh, we're, we're over here uh, on the dry side. And uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, right, so we're here tonight. Uh, and we're talking about a fire that happened uh, down here, uh, about a 45-minute drive south of here in the town of Malden in Pine City. On September 7th of 2020, on Labor Day, wildfires raged through the northern Whitman County, just 35 miles south of here, fanned by wind gusts as high as 50 miles per hour, the Bab, Road fire consumed more than 15,000 acres of Palouse farmland and habitat and engulfed the towns of Malden and Pine City, forcing nearly 200 residents to evacuate. The fast-moving fire consumed the town of Malden in only two and a half hours, spewing briquette-sized embers and destroying 80% of the town's buildings, many down to their foundations. Among the rubble, are the majority of homes and the town's only post office, town hall, fire station, food bank, and library. Our speaker this evening, Scott Hokinson, is, uh, is founder and former director of the Pine Creek Community Long-Term Restoration Group. He is uh, currently a firefighter and also was formerly a town council member in Malden. He's working towards his master's in urban planning. Are you, are you still working? No. Not at the moment, taking a break. It's COVID, people. Give them a break. In this talk, Scott is going to be discussing the urgency of planning to be resilient to our changing climate and lessons learned that can help other communities in the, in the Northwest. We're so happy to have him here with us tonight. Join me in welcoming Scott Hokinson. Thank you very much. 
Uh, thank you to Professor Henning, Dr. Henning, uh, and Gonzaga uh, Climate Center for asking me to speak to you tonight. Uh, hello to everyone online. Hello to my former town's people um, and people that I've worked with on the recovery effort. Uh, I haven't uh, spoken in public. I haven't uh, done any interviews for quite some time. Uh, I had to take a break. Uh, it was uh, the effects of the fire, uh, other things, losing my home, uh, working for the long-term recovery, dealing with uh, all of the things that were happening. Uh, it, for my health, uh, it was best if I, if I stepped away for a bit. Uh, just to start off, I was diagnosed with, with PTSD uh, a few months after the fire because I was told by uh, fellow firefighters and by the Director of State Emergency Management, Robert Ezell, who looked me right in the eye after he flew into, into Malden and said, you need to get yourself help or you're not going to be good to anybody, much less yourself, and you'll live with this forever. So luckily I took that advice, uh, thankfully, you know, and uh, I, I'm here to report that things are, are much, much better after. I'm, I'm tearing up a little bit talking about it because it's really nice to be able to be here and talk about what went wrong, what went right, and what can possibly happen in the future. If I was to, if you wanna sum all of this up, uh, my talk, it's basically, I would love to go do a scared straight talk to town councils and say, and to townspeople and say, if something's coming, you gotta have some sort of plan. And it can't be a tech plan. It can't be on your phone. It can't be on a computer. It can't be on a screen. It can't be complicated. It has to be as simple as, well, if you're from Spokane and you get separated, <laughs> Back in the old days, you'd meet at the GOAT, right? Like, we'll meet at the GOAT, or we'll meet at a store or something. If you're in Seattle, maybe it's the, uh, the pig at Pike Place Market. Simple things like that are what really saved us. We got really lucky in Malden. We got very, very lucky that everybody lived. We got everybody out alive. And we didn't know for a while. We didn't know for a few weeks if that was, if that was the case. In fact, we were told that, that quite a few people most likely perished and that we would find bodies at some point. Uh, and that was scary. That was really scary. Um, again, my name is Scott Hokinson. I, I, uh, I moved to Malden. Uh, I had a past in housing. I'd worked in for-profit housing. I worked uh, for Polygon Northwest. Uh, we built about a thousand new homes a year. Uh, I worked with condominiums, uh, new homeowners associations, worked with boards of directors, setting up nonprofit boards, that type of thing. Uh, I also worked with Spokane Housing Ventures as their operations director uh, here in Spokane. So I had a background in housing. Uh, I happened to be on the Malden Fire Department. I also happened to be an elected uh, town council member the day of the fire. So the day of the fire, I had come home early uh, uh, with my partner, uh, my, my former partner now, um, and we were uh, doing normal Monday things on a holiday. Uh, the we started smelling smoke. Uh, some neighbor, neighbors had some questions about it. I went to drive to look to see if I could find any, any fire, any smoke. It smelled bad. It smelled really bad. It smelled concerning. So I couldn't find anything. And then it, there was something, just a feeling where people started to look at each other. We had no warnings yet. We didn't receive anything on a radio. We didn't receive anything on phones. I'm on the fire department. I didn't receive anything, any notification but it just seemed like a good idea to start getting people out. I had to, I had to look uh, my former partner in the eyes and say, this is serious. You need to leave right now. You've got two minutes to grab whatever you can. Two minutes, that's it. You need to leave in your car. Don't hurt anybody. Be very careful driving. And if you, you know, go this way or this way, I don't know which because there was smoke coming from a lot of different directions. And I had to let her know, if you see flame, you're going to have to make a decision. Do you drive through it? Or do you back up and try another direction? And if you drive into it, is it going to be bad enough? When are you going to back out or when do you step on the gas? Again, try not to hurt anybody. She was pretty incredulous, <laughs> not really, that this was, that this was really happening. And I, again, I felt very lucky that I was, I was there and able to respond <clears throat> that way and then help my neighbors in the same way, knocking on doors. I'm wearing the only thing. These boots right here are the only thing that I have after the fire. That's it, because I had them on the day of the fire. Uh, my clothes ended up smelling like chemicals and smoke, um, and uh, they frankly made me sick to smell them. So, uh, but these boots are important to me because they, they made it, and I'm not a subject matter expert in anything, absolutely anything. I climb trees for a living. Uh, is the tree down? Pay me. Like, it's pretty easy. 
that's what I'm doing right now instead of going to school again is I needed something that, you know, I could work outside. It was very simple yet very complicated and also was risky. You know, it really takes my mind off things if I have to focus on staying alive. So that works for me. What works for you in a disaster, I don't know, but I'm here to answer any of your questions about what could have happened, what might, what happened that worked well, what didn't go well. Um, I think we were lucky that in a lot of ways, a lot of the things that, that may have had been strikes against Malden, I say now that, that we're actually in our favor because I could look at my neighbors and I would know instantly if I said, did you get so-and-so or have you seen anybody or no, we're good. And we were able to work together symbiotically pretty well to affect that. I, I don't even know how to describe it. It was, um, it, it was like you see in the movies. It was, you know, there was fire, there was smoke. Uh, people were driving everywhere, people yelling and screaming. Uh, some people didn't want to leave. Uh, it was scary. It was really scary. <coughs> and the, the big thing for us, too, after uh, the next day, after the fire, is we didn't know how many people we had lost. We didn't know how to recover. We didn't know what to do. We didn't know. And then we had to deal with people's trauma. You know, people were so upset that we had to give literally emotional first aid to some people who needed it. And then those people who were treating people had to go take care of themselves. And there's a ripple effect. So again, not a subject matter expert, just somebody who lived it, who can you know, talk to others about what you can expect. And what you can expect is your phone's not gonna work. People are not gonna show up to help right away. You're gonna, be, you're gonna have to self-rescue. You're going to have to self-rescue. And you're gonna have to take care of yourself. Uh, I drank more than normal after the fire, and I decided that was probably not a good thing, so I had to put it away entirely. It helped immensely with my recovery and the recovery of my family too. Um, I found that with the PTSD, and I'm just gonna be frank about this, drinking did absolutely no good. Maybe the night of, maybe. But my dreams became terrible um, and became very hard to live a life. I, for the first time in my life, pretty upbeat, somewhat outgoing. For the first time in my life, I understood why people go live in the woods when they have PTSD, why people don't wanna deal with other people. The things that I've seen in movies to deal with PTSD or trauma are very true. I, had n I never thought that I would see flashes of things that weren't there in front of me, but I did after the fire. Even after we knew that everyone had lived from the fire, I have kids, for some reason that, that hearing that there might be children who had passed away in the fire perished, which they didn't, I still had dreams, I had dreams of not checking a truck or not checking someone's house or that I had forgotten something or left it. Um, you know, kind of like that dream maybe everybody's had of you go to school and you're, you know, and you dream and you're in your underwear, you know, and, oh, what am I doing here? But it was as bad as it gets for me. I've never had worse thoughts in my head and I couldn't get them out. And that was, uh, luckily I, I, got, I got to work with a great therapist and, and that was extraordinarily helpful. And the reason that I'm talking to you about this is that any, this can happen to anyone, absolutely anyone. We never thought this would happen to us. We had a fire much like this three and a half years before, three years before our fire, but it didn't come, I mean, it came kind of close. We were talking about evacuation. We, most people were getting ready to leave. It was definitely scary, but nothing like what we had. And if we had something that was exponentially worse than what we'd ever experienced before, what's not to say that we couldn't have something else exponentially worse? You've seen it happen in Oregon where it happened in neighborhoods. It's happened in Spokane. It can happen anywhere. So I try to talk as honestly about my experience as I can. Again, not as a subject matter expert, not as a know-it-all, just someone who's been through it. And the kids, you know, the kids were, that was a tough thing. It was, it was hard to deal with thoughts that children had been harmed that I hadn't done my job, uh, even as a volunteer firefighter. So that was really what precipitated me going to get help for myself. Uh, but on the other side of it, fast forward to now, when I, I haven't done an interview and I haven't been in public and I haven't spoken, um, it's very easy for me to be here. It's very comfortable. And I, I don't have to <laughs> worry, you know, some friends ask me, are you nervous, are you, are you ready? I said, I, I live this, you know, <laughs> it was a nightmare and I'm just going to tell people about it, that's all. 
and hopefully to answer questions that they might have or even see some flaws in what we did or what I did that can help others and to normalize this conversation because disaster is going to strike and has been. It is going to strike other people. So again, on that scared straight premise, maybe you can talk to people when you see them traumatized by disaster. Their towns are gone or they lose their home or things like that, that <clears throat> there definitely is a way out. Um, and I personally have, uh, I did not know this, but there's, there's 14 categories for, for PTSD, for trauma, 14 categories. I score 13 out of those 14. So that means violence, uh, abuse, uh, you know, now natural disaster, everything but a war I've been through. And I don't say this to brag. I say this to show that I was able to recover from it. And I didn't know that before. I mean, we booked this speaking <laughs> quite some time before. Um, the things that went really right is everybody lived. The things that went really right is people who didn't do well before sometimes were able to join together, join forces. The things that were difficult is, you know you're, when you're supposed to put the face mask on yourself on the airplane before you, before you help others? Everybody needed a face mask, you know, where I was from. But nobody was coming to help. So we had a few people. Uh, Jerry Bozarth is here, Paul Kimmel. Um, Jerry's with Spokane County Emergency Management. He was there very soon. Paul Kimmel was there the day after uh, from Avista. A number of other people came to help too, but we were waiting for help that, that didn't show up. So all of this, all of this could have been better, all of this, if we had a basic plan, if we just had a basic plan. And I don't kick myself because we didn't expect it. This is a railroad town, a railroad town. A railroad used to run through town, and there still is the John Wayne or uh, Palouse to Cascades Trail that runs through the town of Malden. Please bike it if you haven't. Um, but the railroad used to go through, and there was people whose job it was to put out fires for 50, 60 years because there were so many sparks that came off the train that fires were started all the time. But it never caused a fire like this, ever, not even close, through all that history. So there has been change. It was very dry. It was very hot. It was very windy. Had someone talked to us before, had someone even put it in front of us, we may not have done anything with the information. Hey, you know, you're, it would help to have a plan. Um, but if someone from a school like this, if someone like me or someone like you who has some experience and you can say, actually, these, these things are becoming more common and we don't know where they're going to hit, uh, but here's a basic plan. And again, I'm recommending it should be as simple as possible. You know, something like stop, drop, and roll, but I don't know what it would be yet. But um, I'm sorry, I'm looking a lot at my, uh, my fellow uh, townspeople. Can you raise your hands? Thanks. It's good to see you guys. Um, things, too, that, that change, that get taken away in something like this is, I remember when uh, my neighbor was so happy I could hear her singing one night, about 8.15. I was in my house. She was in hers. She didn't even know that I could hear her, but that meant something to me. You know, that meant something that, that that's, that's community. That's knowing people. That's being part of something. And although all of that was taken away, and we won't have it again the way it was, many people are still working towards rebuilding that. And people want to help. People come in from all over who need to help. People like me probably now, who now have a drive to do something for others, because at the time, I wasn't able to do everything that I wanted to. And I've, I've, I'm learning so much, too, about what these recoveries can look at. And there's some subject matter experts here tonight who know much more about recovery of areas, all the people uh, and agencies and organizations and religious groups that come in to help. Um, and that's, that's the next thing that I wanted to talk about is that there are things that go wrong, things that go right, but if you have that plan, that stop, drop, and roll, and again, I don't have an acronym, I don't know what it is, but Whatever it is for you, in your home, in your life, in your family, it really pays to have a plan. It really pays to have a plan. If someone comes to you or you yourself see something and it is that, hey, you're going to have to leave right now, you can't take anything with you, and you might have to drive through fire. That's not a fun conversation, but if you're ready for it, that, that is a 
wholly different, wholly different realm there. It's something is possible, and yes, it's bad, but now you know what to do with it instead of an unknown, because much like if I said right now, you have to leave here, I don't know which direction is safe, and all you can take is what you have with you. Your life changes. Your life really changes. So, you know, I, as a firefighter there, it was, it was difficult because I didn't know what the proper response was or how to talk to people at their doors, you know? And I had to go back a couple times to some people and say, no, you really have to go. You know, they'd sit down to watch TV. No, this is, this is serious. I'm like, and how do I make it, how do I let you know without scaring you? But now I realize that my response would be much different, you know? This is your one chance. You have to go now. No, I'm not joking. I mean, you have to go through that thing. No, I, no I'm not kidding. No, it's not just smoke. No, it's because we have smoke, right? We have other disasters that are happening. So having that preparedness, having that readiness, and I don't know what it is. I mean, there's publications that are out. There's people that have come to help us. Uh, Eastern Washington, uh, has, uh, we were able to partner with them, and they've sent students down to do a lot of, do a lot of work to see what we can do to, to create things that will make our recovery, Malden's recovery better. But I think with the things that are happening in the world, it's gonna make sense to have an evacuation plan and to have a plan of what happens when things are their very worst. What are you going to do? What am I going to do? What's my mental state going to be? Uh, because this, I, I never imagined that would be happening to me that Labor Day. That was the last thing from my mind, absolutely. Um, we're still stunned. Are we not still stunned, kind of? <laughs> I, I still think, wait, that didn't, that, I guess that happened, yeah. Um, the next thing is a mental port. And we have online people. Are there any questions coming in online, Brian? I mean, Professor Hanning, sorry. Okay. Um, if anybody has online, I'm not, maybe I haven't been presenting as much to you, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those too. Um, Sure. So before the fires, did the town of Malden have any sort of emergency planning in place already? I can answer that. It's we had we had a tiny one. Repeat the question. Oh, okay. So the question was uh, before the fire, did Malden have any sort of emergency planning? So no. We turned down some opportunities. We turned down even some money. We found out later some quite large amounts of money that had possibly been there for us to do, but we were too small. It was no big deal. Oh, we're not, a, you know, we're out in the country. We take care of ourselves. We got this. We did have a, a minor plan because how I got to be on the town council uh, at first um, uh, was, and the fire department was at the first fire that happened three and a half years before the 2020 fire. I went down to help out the mayor and some others with evacuation plans and the police and uh, they asked me later, they said, hey, you should be on town council and, and you should be on the fire department. And I said, okay. And so the first meeting I, I went to as a town council member, I said, well, what if we had a, do we have an evacuation plan? And they said, we don't. And I said, well, let's make one, a basic one. You know, if we have to go east, we'll go to the, the church in St. John. If we have to go west, we'll go to the school in Rosalia. And everybody agreed that was easy. So we had other business to do, so we, we went on with it. So that was our evacuation plan. And when our fire came, we put it into place. We talked about, it. okay, you, we don't know which way you have to go, but go there, you know, try to, try to go there. So even a basic plan is better than no plan. In fact, probably a basic plan is probably the best plan. Um, let me see. So the, the thing, did I, answer, did I answer your question? Okay, so I, we would have benefited from, again, I'm going to talk about simplicity here. It's got to be simple. It's got to be easy. It's got to be where... I can come to you, even if we don't know each other, I can say, hey, I'm Scott, I'm on the fire department, it's A plan, or it's B plan. Do you know what that is? Okay, you know, something super simple, so we have that communication, we have that understanding. Okay. You want to take one? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So we have a question from Paxton Ann DePoe, she asks, uh, or they ask, in terms of building new infrastructure, what do you think are the most important things for a city to focus on to prevent disaster in the face of a potential event such as the fire in Malden? 
in terms of building infrastructure or new infrastructure, they say? Yeah, I would say that the most important thing is to have a, that, that's a great question. Was it Pat? Is that right? Uh, Paxton. Paxton. Thanks for the question, Paxton. Hopefully I answered. If not, please send a message. I'll be happy to, to go over it. Uh, the most important thing as far as infrastructure was a place to meet, period, a place to meet. We needed a place where we could all gather and, and talk it out and work thing or be upset or find out who's alive and who's dead. I mean, frankly, honestly, that's to find out who's alive and who's dead at first and to take care of each other. Um, and not even tell our stories in the beginning. It wasn't even what happened or this or, oh, I could, because we all lived it. So we didn't have to actually tell each other how bad it was because we lived it. So um, having a place to meet is the utmost importance. Uh, we, we had a tent, which worked for us. And I, I have fond memories of that tent. Um, I have fond memories of some of the bad times when they were humorous and then when things actually got good. I remember the first good meeting we had. And there was like, it was starting to get cold a little bit and it smelled not as burnt. <laughs> and we had a meeting where people were actually getting along thinking, hey, it might, this might go in a good direction. Um, it instills not just hope, but it gives people something to do and somewhere to go. And then this isn't so much as an infrastructure thing, but a, a human need that I think is as important as that infrastructure part is we had food. We were lucky that people brought in food a couple days a week and it was Wednesdays. Uh, were lunch days, and that was, uh, that was a big part of our recovery. Um, the part that I'd like to answer, that I'd like to talk about briefly is what, what, what I didn't know about the recovery. What I didn't know could fill a room. <laughs> I, I didn't know many, many things, and I'm, I've found quite a few out, but the thing that I would recommend in preparedness is there's going to be great gaps. There's going to be problems. It's just, it's a disaster. You know, normally it's, hey, this kitchen's a disaster. No, your kitchen's not a disaster. An entire town wiped off the map, you know, with people angry and upset. Um, and then, you know, when, when people start ailing, uh, older people died after the fire. Uh, you know, we had, a, we had a death rate that was pretty high. Um, quite a few of, of our neighbors, um, uh, one uh, took his own life. Uh, he had other health issues, but it probably didn't help, you know, looking like... I, and, you know, when I see things that are happening in uh, Ukraine, uh, that's what it looks like, doesn't it? it? Exactly. And all I can think is how grateful I am that we don't live in a war zone, even though ours looked like a war zone, and I stopped saying that. Um, but we, now, if I could go back, we should not have been allowed back in there. We should have had some sort of cleanup. We should not have. We don't know the effects of what those toxins, chemicals, who knows what. We should not have been allowed back in there. We, we live in a small county, um, not a lot of people. And it's frankly, you know, if you're not hurting anybody, you can, you can kind of do what you need to do. Because um, really no one else is going to help you unless you're broken down the side of the road. And even if your neighbors hate you, they're going to stop and help you. They're, everyone's going to, you're going to be taken care of. Um, but there was a very much a drive to get back in and start rebuilding and we're going to stay. I mean, in a perfect world, we would have said, hey, can we have a chunk of land <laughs> approximately the size of this and we'll just, we'll figure out a temporary town while all this stuff's happening. I mean, we pushed so hard for cleanup that uh, the state paid for the first time, paid for a, a large portion of a cleanup that we didn't know if we were going to get FEMA money for. That had never happened before. Um, Pete Hartman. Uh, Washington State Emergency Management is the one who pushed very hard for that. Uh, very hard. So hard, in fact, that uh, political reasons in the town itself pushed him out. Because he pushed so hard to get for a cleanup that he stepped on some toes. Upset people. That's the part about these disasters is, at least that I've been in, is everything ripples. And you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know whose feelings you're going to hurt. You don't know how... No matter how hard you're trying to do the right thing, it might be the wrong thing. So everybody wants to help. Everybody says they want to help, and they do. Um, and that's the beauty of it. I mean, that's, that's the beauty of it. You can step back. Like, you know, if, if, if we all can step back who, who lived in Malden and, and look at the efforts now without and take our personal pain out of the deal, completely take that out, it's just a cycle, you know? The town was built up, 
it went down, and then it burned, and now it's being rebuilt. I mean, that's, that happens all over. That's, that's the story of life. But we attach our, you know, well, my grandmother's quilt was in there, you know, my grandfather's shotgun, you know, that my uncle built that house, that type of thing. Um, those things are, they're very hard to replace, definitely. And I can't speak to that because I'm a human and I'm limited, <laughs> you know? And I, I, I'm, I'm all over the map on what's helpful and what's not. Uh, any more questions at all? <laughs> don't mind me. So knowing, ooh, I don't like that. So knowing that uh, we're living through a changing climate and that disasters like the fire that destroyed Malden are actually going to be more frequent, um, what would you identify as the agency that should be working with rural spaces in Washington to do planning before disasters? Because it's not enough, I don't think, for town by town to go through it, um, especially if they haven't been given appropriate information about the risk under a changing climate of fire destroying their town. So, you know, like what level of planning should be happening throughout rural Washington? Do you think it should be city council by city council? Or should there be like county level planning for climate disasters, state level, national level? I mean, so I'm just really interested in what your understanding is after having lived through an experience like you did with minimal planning ahead of time. If you could go back, who would you want to have help you plan for something like this to happen in the future? So it's a, that's a great question. Uh, do I need to repeat it for online people? Or Okay, um, excellent question. Uh, multifaceted, excellent question. There's two answers. The first and easiest is you want people like Jerry Bozarth from Spokane County Emergency Management, truly. You want people who show up and say, uh, like a trusted uncle or aunt, someone who is like family but not as judgy. <laughs> you know, someone who's close but not too close. Someone who can tell you when you're, when you're starting to smell it up a little bit and when you're not, when you're doing well. Like truly, you need someone who has experience who can, who can push you in the right direction. Now, Washington State Emergency Management helped a lot too. Our county is extraordinarily small, Whitman County. Um, our emergency management manager uh, had two other jobs um, inside the county, but still two other jobs. And so just did not have the bandwidth to, to do that. So we were lucky that Spokane County Emergency Management saw fit that Jerry could come help us. Uh, Paul Kimmel at Avista, his connections, political connections and otherwise, were invaluable in our recovery. So it really takes, it does take someone who knows, but also a connection, and then it takes someone who can facilitate all of those things, someone who can be the nexus of that. And I think a lot of the recovery models call it, um, you know, you need somebody local who has some responsibility, and has some local uh, uh, credentials somewhat, and who's trustworthy, um, but also who can work with all of those, those agencies. Um, now, I, I, was, I acted in that capacity in some way, although as a, as a disaster survivor, however you want to place, you know, I lost my home, I was there the day of, I never should, you know, I shouldn't have been there that long. I, I shouldn't have been, you know, I shouldn't have been there that long. But it, but it, it it needed to be done, and that's what it was in Malden. We just did what needed to be done for as long as we could, <laughs> and then passed the job on to somebody else. Yeah, I thought you might. <laughs> and then we'll go up to you after. Uh, I just wanted to add, um, you know, a great answer, Scott. Uh, but I did want to add that, you know, Whitman County has a comprehensive emergency man, or excuse me, comprehensive emergency management plan, but also a mitigation plan. And uh, just like Spokane County, and each county should have one. Some of the smaller counties do not, uh, usually due to funding issues. But Whitman County had one, and unfortunately, Malden had chose not to participate in it. So basically, the week after the fire, um, we were fortunate to uh, have some connections with the contractor that did the Whitman County plan, and uh, she stepped in and got an annex uh, drawn up to the plan almost immediately. And this is where some of that planning comes in to prevent natural disasters and uh, wildfire being one of them. Um, 
I, my question is uh, maybe a little bit prior to this. It's about communication. We happen to be coming back um, down, what is it, 84 on the Washington side of the, of the gorge the day of the, the Malden fire. We didn't know it. We had evacuated um, from a hiking trip because of smoke. Um, and we, we were going to come up through Tri-Cities and we got stopped by the Sheriff's Department. They had closed the road at that point. And they, were, um, they told us, we'll try and go up one of these narrow two-lane canyon roads, but uh, I-90 is closed too. We don't know where you'll be able to get. We don't know if you'll get through. And that seemed a little dicey <laughs> to me to be heading up canyon roads like that. So we ended up turning back and driving west, got stopped that way as well. And we um, finally found a place to camp out on an island. Um, and some sheriff uh, was bringing some of the, uh, evacuating. E evacuating some people there and said we could end up staying there. My point is, um, so it's, an, it's a dynamic situation, but how can communication about where it's actually safe to evacuate, as you had mentioned earlier, um, even from law enforcement, I mean, how, how, how can that be bettered? for folks? That, that's a great question. I can only answer it from my experience. Uh, and my experience is, is you know, the, the fire department has a great system of alerting people. Um, and even here in Spokane, if there's, um, if there's an emergency as an EMT, I, it could, you know, there's an alert that goes out uh, and I could find out if someone needs help just in the next room. So rather than waiting for a response. So there's some very quick response on phones, but truly I cannot emphasize this enough. We need appropriate technology, which I think means radio. And I think on radio, we need it to be local, because when they're nationally syndicated, we don't get any news. The last big windstorm we had, there was nothing on local news, nothing on local radio, because it was all national. It was all just piped in. So if you were able to you know, tune into an emergency station and listen to a report, and maybe there are such things, but I think that we all need to know that. I think we need to have an access point of, what is it? Just like we have 911, I think there needs to be an easy go to, wh what are we going to do? Because yeah, we didn't know. W we just made the call that we were gonna get out of there. And then we got the notification that it was a, an, a level that we needed to evacuate in Malden. So yeah, it's extraordinarily scary not knowing <laughs> where you're going to go or what you're driving into, very much so. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. This is a prevention question. So I heard you say, Malden is a, a railroad town, and the rail, railroad or the rail cars would go by and set off a little fire and it would burn whatever it would burn. So back in the day, the undergrowth could, was burned out more regularly. N now that the trains don't go through there anymore, is there anything that, like a prescribed burn that could help prevent future fires like this that are so big? Uh, no, it used to not cause fires. It would just cause little spot fires that then would mostly that would burn out. Uh, there was a few times it would, conf you know, take off, but not much at all. And for the most part, anytime you can burn that, it's probably usually too dry to burn. So um, we didn't see it as a problem. And it prescribed burn in Whitman. What? That, that's I mean, that's what happens in forests. So it's not something that that we had talked about. We hadn't gotten to that stage of, you know, what can we do to prevent. Um, we talked some things, the mayor had a, you know, lots of ideas about certain things, as did others of a, a wall of water. You know, could we put irrigation equipment up to, you know, a bulldozing uh, essentially a moat, a, a, a dirt moat around the town to prevent if things came in again. Um, but again, we were responding in the moment too, you know, very much emotionally rather than with the, with the hindsight uh, of making good decisions. So. It's an interesting question. I haven't thought about that, though. Scott, yes. I can share some of your perspective. As a 28-year military veteran, more than half a century ago, I understand about the PTSD stuff. And then in 1991, I lived in the South Spokane Valley, where 18 houses of our neighborhood burned to within two blocks of my house. And I and other people helped to break a fire line there that stopped the fire from getting further than it did. So I'm with you all the way, and it's 
uh, a terrible thing and what do you do? Thank you, yeah. I, um, yeah, I identify with a lot of people. I'm in a club now, I was told <laughs> um, by a few people. I'm in a club, that, that PTSD club. That I mean, it could come back anytime. It could be tomorrow that, you know, just at this moment, I, I was able to, uh, so I'm, I'm sorry that you've had to go through what you've gone through too, but thank you for your question, or thank you for your comment. I had a question, Scott, about the FireWise program. I don't know sure. Uh, so you mentioned the difference between forest fires and, and grass fire. And I don't, I don't have any uh, knowledge about this, so I'm really speaking from ignorance. Uh, but when I think of fires, too, I think of, of a fast-moving you know, forest fire. And you need defensible space. And, and the FireWise program is about you know, helping homeowners know how to properly maintain their property so that, that you know, fuels are away from the home. But a grass fire you know, in Malden or last year in Colorado is not something we typically think about. And I'm reminding you know, of, the, of the question you're asking, too. So is the Fireway, maybe this is a question for you, I'm not sure, if the Fireway's program designed to help with defensible space for grass fires, is it already designed to help people do that? It, it is, yes. Yep. And I, I can let Jerry answer more, too, on that. But uh, from my research in the beginning, too, and from what I saw in Malden, um, yeah, it is. The, the WUI, the Wildland Urban Interface, is something that we're all becoming aware of. But I'm here to tell you from experience, I can tell you one thing. <laughs> uh, wooden exterior decks made houses burn. Non-metal roofs made houses burn. Garbage or trash or other things next to a home made houses burn. The houses that made it had metal roofs and didn't have exterior wood decks. Or people stayed to, f some of our neighbors came back to fight the fire after the firefighters had left because it was too dangerous. Some of our neighbors came back because they didn't have insurance and it's all they had. I, if I can help anybody not have to have that, <laughs> I, I would do that. If they hadn't had those wooden decks, they would not have had to come back. They wouldn't have had that, they, their house would not have burned. Um, and we saw it where, you know, even if, a, if someone did have a metal roof, everything was great at their place. If their neighbor's house wasn't up to code, that could burn a perfectly firewise house. So it's a community thing. It's, it's not a matter of personal freedom and I'm not hurting anybody. It, it absolutely can, can kill people. Mm -hmm. So um, it's definitely something that I think we'll be looking more at. So do you think the firewise program is sufficient as it's currently designed? Because I, I assume that those defensible spaces didn't see the wood decks as a problem and didn't require, well, they didn't require metal roofs, obviously, but um, if they had followed all the rules, would that have sufficiently safeguarded them from the problem? Probably, it sounds like not. Well, the, the best, the thing that I, I've seen is, you know, a, a house with a metal roof that's burned into the earth, truly. Like that is going, that's underground and that would be, it doesn't have to be fancy. And I, I think it'd be very wise if, you know, governing bodies started to look at this of, you know, it, it, the temperature's down, and for heat and for fires and for smoke and for other things. I mean, imagine if we could have sheltered in place. Imagine if we had, or even some houses, imagine if tax breaks were given rather than oversight that you have to have a, a, a wooden house that goes up and that is like kindling when it burns. I think that might've been Paxton's question online that began with on new, oh, okay. new infrastructure. I think mm -hmm. maybe they met uh, in a way design principles perhaps you know, in terms of how infrastructure should be built. I, I could be wrong. Yeah, one of the things uh, then Paxton that uh, we did do quickly is that uh, the houses that were being built, we asked that they have metal roofs. Um, we looked at the cost of uh, fireproof uh, siding and that was prohibitive at the moment. So we went with metal roofs. That was, that was what we asked. So Rachel. Sorry, so on the defensible space, the, the, if we all had green yards, we, we probably would have lost 75% less houses than we did because it was a grassland fire. I mean, there was the, the trees, but it gets into town and when your yard's this tall because there's not an ordinance that tells you you have to keep your yard mowed, it just continues feeding it. And not a single house survived that had a messy yard, like a non-mowed yard, all of the houses that survived, like Scott said, they also had well-kept yards. 
So, and the towns address that. They've put in an ordinance of 12 inches, I think, but still that, so the defensible space guidelines work when people follow them. Yeah, and there's, uh, thank you, Rachel. Um, Rachel's a board member of the, yeah, of, <laughs> of the Pine Creek Community Long-Term Recovery Group, um, and she and I were neighbors, kitty corner from each other. Um, one thing too I wanted to address, um, in Norway, uh, there are ordinances. If you have a home over a certain size, it's like 800 square feet. If you have a home or a dwelling where anybody lives at any amount of time, if it's over 800 square feet, not an apartment or a condo, freestanding, you have to have an alternative heat source. You have to have an alternative heat source. That ends up being a wood stove. There's a lot of trees there, it's inexpensive. And what this is for, and the government says so, is to stop panic in emergencies. So that when there isn't electricity or something's happening or the road's closed, at least you can be warm inside of your house. We found that losing our homes and losing everything, because <laughs> we lived 45 minutes away from most everywhere, so we had extra. And if we didn't, we were making do and we knew in our minds that we needed to restock that. Eggs, tires, I bet you everybody in Malden, our cars may not have been the nicest looking, but we knew exactly how well they were running, didn't we? Because you could not give it to chance. You had to be prepared. And so to not be prepared for this was an extra blow to a lot of people. A lot of my neighbors were devastated and didn't know what they were going to do because a lot of their food was, was stored up and they didn't have money to buy extra food. They literally had what they had in their freezer and what they prepared and what they'd saved and grown. And that was, that was a, a resilient way of life. And when all of that, I mean, one of the reasons I moved to Malden is because there was a gravity water system and I had a wood stove and it felt safe and kind of no matter what, and I had a big garden that I was growing food. And when all that gets wiped off the map, I wish I would have had the mental resilience to know what's my plan? What am I gonna do when everything goes as bad as it can go without losing a life? Um, any other questions? I'm happy to take anything. Yes. I think the microphone will come up to you. And anybody has any uh, online has any questions, I'm happy to answer them too. Let me check that. This is a, kind of a water-related question and a preparedness question. If you take yourself back to that day, are there any um, increased inefficiencies with regards to water that you could see the town being more prepared you know, for, for, the, for the storm? So that's a great question. We were told that by numerous people and agencies that even if there were 100 air craft responding and 100 trucks, you couldn't have stopped this. So if you think of like lighting a campfire and then putting a, a blower on it, like it just, it was pushing flames that, that we couldn't put out. So yes, there could have been infrastructure that was better. Um, we were lucky that we didn't lose the water system. But we were told that something like this, there was no stopping it. Absolutely no stopping it. And that's from emergency managers, fire department members, uh, people who saw this, who couldn't believe the level of devastation. Um, real quickly, uh, Brett Myers and every deputy uh, that he has uh, from the Whitman County Sheriff's Department save lives. They're the true heroes of this story. Uh, they save lives. They came through on their loudspeakers and help the people who are trying to get out themselves or help their neighbors get out and made it valid. They put the force of law behind it. And if someone didn't want to go, if I came to you and said, it, it's as bad as it can get, you have to go. And you said, screw you, I'm saving my house. Great, good luck to you. You go on to the next person. They didn't mess with people. But them coming through with loudspeakers made it legitimate. <laughs> and it made us feel like, oh, okay. And that's, that's the biggest thing, if, if, I can, if I can help with anything, it's that I wish we could have had a legitimacy card. Like, like, okay, this is really happening. It's really that bad. And I think in our modern lives, threat of nuclear war, other things, it's okay to be really worried. It's okay to be really stressed. It's okay to do that and to not know what's appropriate or not. Because there are cases when it, it is that. It, it is as bad as it gets and you have to run for your life. And it doesn't hurt to have a plan. In fact, it helps to have a plan. Uh, mentally, financially, I wish I wouldn't have kept everything in one place. <laughs> There's lots of little things that, that, that we could probably tell you from our experience, but um, any other questions?
Oh, it's good to see you guys. It's really good <laughs> to see you guys. Um, if there's one thing that I could say from the fire, you know, nine months pregnant on bed rest here, fell down a whole flight of stairs. That, that, was, that was fun. It wasn't really real until the head sheriff comes pounding through my door saying, get out. I'm not kidding. If you don't get out, you're not going to make it. But one thing that made it easy for us is always have a 70, I'm not even kidding, a 72 hour bag in the back of every single one of your vehicles for you, your spouse, all of your children, your mother-in-law in in my case. um, (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I made her grab the pets. Um, Make sure every, everything that you wanna get out of your house, have, have everything photocopied and have a, a tub in the back of one of the vehicles that you know that you drive on the daily so that there is always a copy of birth certificates, social security cards, um, important documents that you know that you won't be able to get a copy of right away because you will need those things. We had to stay in a hotel, but my driver's license, I had just got it in the mail, the, the, cop, the renewal of it, and I had it on the stove. Well, guess what you need to book into a hotel? And guess who didn't have that? So that was fun. So yeah, have it's a year to replace it too because of COVID. Yeah, have a copy of everything, even if it's a photocopy of your driver's license. So make sure you keep that up to date and in in a vehicle, in something that you know that you can hook up to quickly and take with you, be it a camper, a small trailer. Um, things like that, but always keep a spare of, of all of your stuff with you because it will save you in the end. Yeah, and the important thing is to live, right? That's the important thing, is to live. Get out alive and you've won. It didn't seem like it at that time. If we knew that beforehand, maybe we'd feel differently. But um, getting out alive is, is very much the important thing and making sure we got so lucky. This, this You've seen it happen in other places where people don't get as lucky. And... Um, yeah, having things backed up. I heard from a lot of people too. So if you're online, uh, if you're in school and you have pictures on your phone, one phone, back them up on the cloud. Send them somewhere if they're important because there could be a time you may not be able to come back to your dorm or your apartment. Um, You don't know. So if you care about something, back it up if you can. Have it somewhere, parent, friend, relative, anything. If you have something you really like to do, something that's very important to you, something that you can't replace, it it pays to have a a duplicate if you can and and keep it somewhere else. If it's important to your work or your life, there was a lot of people with medication or people left without dentures. Um, We were able to address those those items after, but people were already devastated. And to not have their teeth, truly, or medication, um, I was really surprised by how fast and well some things went in the recovery. We did have quite a few... uh, meetings after the fire where we started uh, getting agencies in, um, replacing cards, replacing things, um, helping people with medication, that kind of stuff. And again, that that infrastructure question, you gotta have a place to go. So where are you gonna go after? And then where are you gonna, where are you gonna go to, to run away? <laughs> you know, where are you gonna go to flee? And then where are you gonna come back together? So it would have helped too if we would have had a meeting place that with COVID, it was thrown. Uh, we 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 try to get you know. Can we meet here? No. Can we meet there? No. We can't. I mean, it was it was quite difficult too, and we had quite a few political issues as well that that we faced. Uh, quite a few. So um, you know, we're, uh, that was a, a whole other part. If anybody has any questions about that, I'd be happy to talk about it. But yes. So I'll go there. <laughs> Why you have me? Since you invited. Um, uh, I'm a big fan of that part of the world. I go down and do the Palooza Cascades Trail pretty, pretty regularly, and I was out there just uh, like three weeks ago. And a lot of what I've heard t- tonight about addressing this is collective action and collective planning, you know, building codes and yard codes and, you know, working together under the supervision of government because who else is going to do it to get this stuff done? Um, And I noticed when I drove through town the other day, and and you know exactly where I'm gonna go with this, there's one two-story building still standing with a couple of large banners on it. And one of them says Trump 2024, and the other says fuck Joe Biden. Um, Is it difficult getting this kind of collective action to work? (laughs) 
Yes. <laughs> no, no, I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll take it. Um, so when I go to Seattle, I'm red. When I come here, I'm blue. So I'm, I think I, I speak pretty well for Washington in a lot of cases, but that's an excellent question because it's very real. Politics do affect everything, everything. And it's dripping with politics. And I don't mean that in a good sense. It was, <sighs> yeah, uh, that was one of the big, what's that? Yeah. Uh, so this is how I make sense of it in my mind. Um, even at a local level, our, at a local level, we could do fine. Um, but once things got to where it was Denver Broncos versus Oakland Raiders versus, like it's, you know, people are so, you know, this side or that side and litmus tests of, well, what do you think about this? Those politics made it very difficult for us. Very difficult. Um, you know, our governor uh, spoke very honestly, and then uh, the former president spoke very honestly about his feelings, and those two things did not help us. They didn't help us at all. Our governor did help us by getting us millions of dollars for a cleanup that nobody else was going to help, and the federal government should have. Plainly, I will say that now, they should have done that. It didn't happen. We paid the price. Things could have happened much faster. We could have, at first it was hard. I'd see other disasters getting, getting loans and it was easy and people popped in, but that's just the price we paid because we're small, because we're in a small corner and we have beautiful sunsets. It was worth it. A lot of it's worth it, don't we? Absolutely beautiful, absolutely beautiful. It looks like paintings of Spain or France in agricultural areas. I mean, really absolutely gorgeous sunsets. They're different all the time. And had we been Issaquah, on the west side, this would have been different. Had we been Sumner, Washington, had we been, you know, a lot of other places, but yeah, the, uh, the strong rebelliousness of some of our neighbors uh, looking for places to place anger, but those, those places, that went everywhere. It went towards the local utility, it went towards the local government, went towards the county or the sheriff's office, and really it's just people trying to, trying to do, do things well. And I can say that honestly, I, I think the best way to describe the political sense too is that people wanted to help, but there's so much going on that they had to run it through the strainer of politics. And that ended up being difficult. You know what I mean? I, I, they, they couldn't just say, yeah, we're going to help. Here's what we're going to do and why. Um, and that was unfortunate. And that was difficult because we were told again and again, help's coming. You know, the, the president's going to sign it. He's going to sign it. And day after day, we did Day after day. I would check every hour the FEMA website for months. Every hour. Wake up in the middle of the night and check. And it was... <sighs> I can speak more. <laughs> okay. So, Scott. Um, so, I'm, I'm Jerry Bozarth. I'm with Spokane County Emergency Management. Uh, my biggest focus is disaster recovery and mitigation. I'm also also a public information officer. Um, and I have been involved since day nine um, in, the, in the Malden recovery, and short term, long term. And, uh, you know, essentially, you know, I'm, I'm from the government, I'm here to help. So, uh, you know, and that's a joke. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it, when it comes to what Scott's talking about with the political situation, um, I've been involved in 14 years in six different presidentially declared disasters throughout Washington State, including the Oso landslide, um, which I was at from day eight to 13, and Okanagan flooding three years ago, four years ago now, uh, and, and then three different uh, presidentially declared disasters in Spokane County. And I have never in my life seen a situation that we had here in Whitman County. And it wasn't just Whitman County. This is part of the problem. Um, you know, it, over here, we know what happened in Whitman County because of the Spokesman Review coverage and the TV coverage and things. But there were, several, there were several other counties that were affected on the exact same day. And that is the only reason why we eventually got a FEMA declared disaster, presidentially declared disaster. Because if it had just been Whitman County, we would not have qualified based on the criteria. So, you know, my problem is, is 
you know, here I come to Malden and I'm assuring people that this was, you know, this is coming. The Calvary's coming. Help is coming. And in my experience, I've never in my life seen a president get in the way of an actual declaration. It's inappropriate. It was completely inappropriate and because disasters are not political. They're people's lives. And I've seen it time and time again. And it doesn't matter what party is in power. They sign the damn thing because it's people's lives. And, and it's part of the Code of Federal Regulation. It's not up to them. In fact, I personally, I don't even know why the president even has to sign it. And Kathy McMorris Rogers actually has instituted or uh, has um, uh, proposed legislation called the Balden Act. And I don't honestly know <laughs> what it stands for. It's, it's, it's something different than the town of Malden, but it, it, it uh, you know, it kind of goes in. Yes, Scott? Making aid to local disasters equal now. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Yeah, I can't, re I, I, I don't remember those things very well. But the bottom line is, is um, after the fact, and after she was unable to uh, move the president off his stance, whatever his stance was for not signing it, um, she, w after we were approved the state of Washington, um, she has proposed this legislation which would make it basically go into law and automatically become a presidentially declared disaster after 30 days should any president decide not to sign that. I don't know where that's at. Do you have any idea, Paul? I don't think, I don't think it made it, it this not. time. It didn't um, make it this but, but bottom line, it's, it's something that has been proposed to take that um, that decision making, whatever the decision making process is, out of that person's hands, regardless of party after the fact. And we're booked till 7.30, right? So we still have some time for questions? Okay. What's that? So one of the things too, and we'll t then we'll take a question up here. Uh, one thing that happened too, I, I'm glad that you brought up uh, animus and anger and acrimony. You know, th these are big things that happen to people getting upset at institutions or personalities because that's the human nature, right? Either everything's great and everything's fine and it's wonderful and we're all gonna have flying cars uh, or else it's Armageddon and we're eating our cats. Uh, that's how human, you know, that's how we, that's kind of the, the duality where we live. Um, you know, I, I, I follow a couple writers and one of them proposes, what's the middle ground? What's, what does that look like? How do you conceptualize the middle ground of not only recovery, but your life or anger or fault or blame? Not, oh, it's, it's you, oh, I can't believe, I'm never, you know, in the recovery, you need everybody. You need everybody possible. And it's, it's a nightmare trying to get personalities and a person who just needs help. And then you have to go triage and, um, but again, if you're gonna have to recover yourself, I mean, it's going to have to, you're gonna have to self-rescue and you're gonna have to deal with each other. And if there w is a plan in place, it just something, it, it would help, it would help a lot. Yes. Uh, can you talk about uh, the landscape around there, if it's all private land or is there some federal land, state land, BLM, anything like that where, where the it, fire started, was it all private? Yeah, so it was uh, it, it private land. Um, Private land, Whitman County is one of the most privately held uh, counties in Washington. Uh, very, very little uh, federal or state land. There is a state park uh, actually uh, that runs through Malden. The, the, the rail trail uh, is part of the state. There is some county land here and there, but um, mostly just uh, small amounts, mostly, mostly private. And the landscape is, is rolling hillsides with, with forested ravines. Um, and fires do happen. They, they do happen where they uh, usually started by farm equipment, um, overheated driving into brush that's not cut low enough. So stubble, field stubble that's not low, uh, truck drives on, sparks a fire and usually gets put out. Um, so what you're seeing is, this is very much what it, what it looked like except it was dark everywhere um, when we were evacuating people. This is after, this is a four or five hours after I think. Um, and this is what it looked like everywhere. 
Questions? What was the temperature that day of the outside air? It cooled down because it got windy. Yeah, 80? It was, yeah, it wasn't hot at all. We were going to go fishing, but it was too windy to fish. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't too hot. It wasn't too hot. But here's something else. I felt something different. Did you feel something different? Something was different. That, that internal knowledge that something, this area isn't safe, that person isn't safe, I should lock my door, or I should this, it was real. <laughs> Following that feeling can maybe save lives. Uh, we, uh, there's a reason that we have those things I found, <laughs> and they were useful that day. Uh, something, was, something was very wrong. Uh, and still, you know, my mind, our minds were saying, oh, is it? But once other people started reacting that way, it was okay. Then it was okay. There's still a social, uh, social contract that, wait, this is... But then once people, we crossed that line together, and then once the sheriff's department came in, I, I felt almost a sense of relief. It's real. I'm not crazy. This is a good thing. We're not just throwing people out of the town for no good reason on a holiday. Uh, the question was, uh, were the animals acting different that day? I don't know because I don't have animals, but I didn't hear anything. I didn't hear any dogs. Um, but I'll tell you that during the fire and after, uh, sorry, uh, the wildlife was, uh, was, was devastated. There was dead deer. There was uh, rabbits. There was uh, I mean, dogs and cats that perished. But uh, the wild animals were the ones that um, they didn't have anywhere to go. And so a lot of them died in place or were injured. And, I, you know, there'd be deer um, sitting in the middle of a road because they, they were damaged and they couldn't do anything. And we didn't know what to do. You know, we didn't, it was, it was bad. But, um, no, I didn't, do you guys, did you see anything with pets? The dogs were. Our okay. Dogs were at least my side that day. Really? Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Yeah, great question. Did they make any different noise or anything? Or is it just they wanted to be close to you? They <laughs> so Scott, I had a question. Um, mm -hmm. So the science of attribution is, uh, is difficult. So the idea of trying to ascribe a particular event to a particular cause, uh, you've got the proximate cause and then you've got maybe ultimate causes. Proximate causes can be sparks from this causing fire for that. Uh, but then you've got sort of atmospheric, sort of larger, literally and figuratively, sort of circumstances. and. There's a no set of science trying to look at whether or not um, this hurricane was larger than it would have been, or this tornado was larger than it would have been, or this whatever, right? And or wouldn't have happened, or would have happened. Uh, we don't have anything like that for wildfire that I know of, um, other than you know historical trends and patterns and pointing to whether or not they're they're different. We've always had wildfires. We've always had forest fires. We've had a long history of suppression. We know that, that that's not making our fires less, that's making them larger. Uh, but we also know that fuels are more arid. We know that the amount of water we're getting in August is less. We know that, right, and we, so we see these trends. So I'm asking a question about, about uh, to what degree uh, part of this is involving not only having disaster preparation plans, for what to do when the awful thing happens. But then, and not even the prevention as in, you know, firewise programs that, that we should all follow, but also the bigger, the bigger context in which this is taking place. Uh, so would you put this in the, a bigger context of changes to our climate and the larger trends and, and challenges mm -hmm. that that presents to small towns with few resources and, and you know, what should they do in, in the face of those changes? Yeah, no, I, thanks for asking me that question. I, uh, uh, yeah, I have, <laughs> I've, I've done quite a bit of research uh, before the fire and after. I feel personally uh, that there's, there's an intersection that, that much, if not all, uh, whether you ascribe the current climate change of things being drier and there's less rain, if you ascribe that to climate change that's human made or whether it's, you ascribe that to natural, natural events, Whatever that might be, that, those things are happening. It's drier, there's less rain. Also, 
we are taking a finite resource, gasoline, oil products, a finite resource from a finite planet and expecting infinite growth. One of the things we're facing is the more energy that goes into an environment, that goes into a society, the more products you can make. But we're running out of the cheapest energy, that, that oil, we're running the cheap, now we're getting like the lesser, lesser quality. And so we're getting lesser quality things. So to talk about how do you create an entire new infrastructure when there is one based on oil? Everything's based on driving a car, going places. Now we're talking about renewables, but all those renewables, they need oil. How you get to work on a, a wind farm is, is diesel fuel. Those things are put up by diesel fuel. <laughs> they're, they're worked on by guys driving diesel trucks there. Solar panels too, they take oil. All of those things, there's, there's nothing that on sustainable side, you take all those energy things and they go into this, what we're doing right now. So if we're going to switch and we're gonna say, what are we gonna do? How are we going to address these things? Could we make firewise homes and communities and build things? I think we have to be very smart and say, what's the lowest level? What's the appropriate tech that we can do? Because if we put the price tag too high, I don't think it's gonna happen. I don't think people are gonna do it. The more complexity that goes into things, I mean, the average home price in Spokane, the median is 400,000 now, 400,000. If that keeps going up and there's, you know, well, it has to have a metal roof and it has to have this, that adds. So what works for everybody? And I, I'm led back to what's the appropriate tech? Could we literally build underground cabins? Could people have an outhouse? Could there be a community well? Not saying that we have to change our entire way of life, but what if there is an appropriate way to, I'm gonna be frank and call it decline, you know, to, to, to make a change, to make a turn. Because right now, a lot of the people I see, you know, homeless are they, trauma, PTSD, things have happened, and it's hard to attach a good job with those things. So people like, if, if I didn't have insurance, my neighbors didn't have insurance, which a lot of ours didn't, they face some pretty tough times, really tough times. I mean, I, I can tell you my story and all that, but I had insurance, you know? I, it, was, it was so much easier for me. It was a trip to Paris for me compared to a lot of my neighbors. Um, and so I wonder about appropriate technology. What would work for them? What would work for the people on, with more limited means and needs? What can happen in the future to give them a safe and comfortable home? Because right now, if we build an above ground home for someone, in an area that could be burnt, and it is burnt, where are they gonna go? What do we do with the refugees? What do we do with people who need a place to live? We found out more than anybody that there's gonna be a lot of people who need a place to live. And so, again, that underground, what if there was a climate comfortable? It's already there, root cellars. That's where people <laughs> put things before refrigeration. It's cool, it could make it through a fire, it could make it through a flood, it could make it through a nuclear attack. So that's my thinking is, I would love to say, yes, houses need metal roofs and metal siding and they need to be angled this way and you know, protection on the eaves and the gutters and firewise, but really, I think there needs to be much simpler answers rather than complexity. So go like a Hobbit-like sort of a, yeah. 100%, absolutely. So Pro-Hobbiton, I like, I like, that's a good place to, I like, it's a pretty good place to, to end if we can end on, on a hobbit-like note, I rather, I rather, I'm rather okay with that. Should we thank Scott for a wonderful time? Thank you all for being here. Uh, just as a reminder, we do have uh, a couple of uh, additional events coming up. And uh, I hope that you're, uh, if you're able to, you'll make it. Those, uh, the first and, and third will both be uh, live streamed. Uh, the one on April 22nd, 3rd, I believe is just in person. Uh, it's really lovely to have you here. One of the reasons why we exist is to host events like this to try and help the community understand uh, pressing issues that confronts our society. Uh, as our, our climate changes, as our, our society tries to absorb those impacts, um, Gonzaga is trying to do his part to help us all understand and respond to this really urgent threat. Uh, we don't have all of the answers, although we are pro-Hobbit. The, you know, the, it's not exactly clear what we should do, but that it, it deserves to be taken you know, very seriously and addressed at, by cities of every scale and every size uh, from disaster preparations, from family plans, uh, to be able to know what to do immediately is really, really useful to the long-term planning 
uh, so that we don't just have to endure uh, and you know withstand uh, those changes, but also hopefully uh, move into a future that wherein we can thrive. Thank you again for coming, and I hope to see you at a future event.